Metacosis Perfect Snellus is here and this is the last video in the muscle physiology series. We will have a quick review about muscles. So here's how this playlist work. The first 25 videos were about introduction, cell membrane, osmosis, etc. Then we had 15 videos about the autonomic nervous system, 10 videos about nerve physiology and 10 about muscle. And this is video number 60, a review of the muscle physiology. Please watch these videos in order for maximum retention. Otherwise, there is no hope for you. We'll go over the review very quickly because we have done this before. Types of muscles, you have skeletal, cardiac and smooth and a table to compare among them. Skeletal muscles are not just for motion, they are also for posture, breathing, heat production, etc. Each muscle is made of muscle fibers, each fiber is made of myofibrils, each fibril is made of myofilaments such as actin and myosin. Which one is the muscle cell? The muscle fiber is the actual cell. Which one obeys the all or none law? The muscle fiber, because this is the actual cell. It was the same story with the nerve. Which part of the nerve obeys the all or none law? the nerve fiber, the neuron, the cell. The muscle is made of fascicles, the fascicle is made of muscle fibers, the muscle fiber is made of fibrils, the fibrils have Z-line and Z-line and between them you have sarcomeres. Don't forget that your skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. Endomesium, perimesium, epimesium. What's the structural unit? The muscle fiber. What's the functional unit? The sarcomere. Where is the sarcomere? It's between one Z-line and the next Z-line. Actin fibers are isotropic, that's why we call them the I-band. How about myosin fibers? Anisotropic, the A-band. Notice the A-band contains myosin and some actin. How about the H-zone? Only myosin. The M-line is in the midline. Don't forget your sarcoplasmic reticulum with two terminal cistern. The cistern is the jail of the calcium. In order for calcium to leave, it has to pass by two doors. The first door is the ranadine receptor. The second door is the dihydroperidine calcium channel protein. The action potential moves on the sarcomere and then traverses through the T-tubule. Calcium goes in the opposite direction in the T-tubule. Calcium is the hero of contraction, especially the ionized calcium. And then actin is gonna slide over myosin and that's your contraction. When you contract, the I band is going to shorten, the A band is not going to change, the H zone is going to shorten, the entire sarcomere will shorten, and the entire muscle will shorten. If we're talking about isotonic contraction. Myosin, heavy chains, light chains, and we have the cross bridges. The cross bridges are two arms and two heads. The heads have three binding sites, for the actin, for the ATP, for the ATPase. Actin is beautiful. Actin is the thin filament. Actin has active sites. Myosin will extend the cross bridges and attach itself to the active sites of actin. If this happens, you'll contract your muscle. But do I need to contract my skeletal muscles all the time? Nope. That's why you need tropomyosin to cover the active sites on the actin. And you'll need troponin with its three components, troponin I to bind actin because actin is the I band because it's isotropic, troponin T to bind tropomycin, troponin C to bind calcium. Calcium is the hero of contraction. When calcium binds troponin C, troponin T is gonna remove tropomycin, exposing the active sites, myosin is gonna bind actin, myosin is gonna pull actin towards the midline, and that's your contraction. Let's zoom in on these structures. Here is the T-tubule, a terminal cistern here, a terminal cistern here, and that's your sarcoplasmic reticulum on both sides. The action potential rushes into the T-tubule, and then this will open the doors for the calcium. Now calcium will leave the prison through that randine receptor, and then the dihydroperidine calcium channel. Calcium is gonna go up the T-tubule until it finds troponin C, and then troponin T is gonna remove tropomycin, exposing the active sites, boom, contraction. Some pharmacology integration. There is a group of drugs that inhibit the ryanodine receptors. They are muscle relaxants because now there will be no contraction. An example here is dantrolene. There is another group of muscle relaxant known as calcium channel blockers, especially the dihydroperidine calcium channel blockers such as nifedipine, amlodipine, etc. For your muscle to contract, a nerve has to come and talk to the muscle, talk the muscle into contraction. This nerve is a cholinergic fiber. Translation, it releases acetylcholine. 
acetylcholine, boom, exocytosis. Now acetylcholine here is in the synaptic cleft. It's going to bind to its nicotinic sub M receptor. Once it binds into its receptor, it creates something called the end plate potential. Is this an action potential? No, shut up, it's not. This one can be graded and can be summated, so it's not an action potential because the action potential cannot be graded and cannot be summated. After the end plate potential, which happens here at the end plate, the muscle will make its own muscle action potential. This muscle action potential is the one that's gonna go down the tubule open the prison for calcium to leave calcium is gonna go up until it finds troponin c and then you contract the neuromuscular transmission is unidirectional there is some delay here about half millisecond there is fatigue calcium is pretty magnesium is yucky methacholine carbacol bethanicol act as if they are acetylcholine Neostigmine, physostigmine will inhibit the acetylcholine trace so that you'll have more acetylcholine. Corari or any drug that has the word corari in it is going to destroy your nicotinic sub M receptor. Anesthesiologists use coraris all the time. The end plate potential is excitatory. The excitatory postsynaptic potentials are excitatory. By the way, EPP is a subtype of EPSP. However, IPSPs are inhibitory. When it comes to neurotransmitters, glutamate and aspartate, excitatory. GABA and glycine, inhibitory. The excitation contraction coupling. First, sodium influx to cause an action potential in the neuron. Then propagation of the action potential. And then calcium comes in through the voltage-gated calcium channels. These lovely calcium channels are attacked by autoantibodies in a disease known as lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. Then calcium in, boom, ruptures, exocytosis, acetylcholine is out, binds to the nicotinic sub M receptor, end plate potential, and then action potential, and then the action potential goes to the T-tubule. Open the calcium channel, get the calcium out of prison through the arandine receptor and the L-type dihydropyridine receptor. Calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium binds to troponin C. Tropomycin is removed, exposing the active sites on the actin. Myosin binds actin. When myosin binds actin, you got four steps. Binding, bending, detachment, return. Bending needs energy. Detachment needs energy. The energy comes from ATP. The energy is released when you break down ATP and then it becomes ADP and the phosphate is out and the energy is out. Detachment requires ATP, that's why rigor mortis happens when you lack ATP after death. This is isotonic contraction. This is isometric contraction. I couldn't lift the dumbbell or when I'm standing on one leg. Isotonic, I actually lifted the dumbbell, but isometric, I could not. And we compare between the two types, pause and review. When Dr. Jordan Peterson said, that was isotonic contraction when he said stand up straight with your shoulders back you bloody lobster this was the isometric contraction isotonic contraction the tone does not change but the muscle will shorten so you can calculate the distance shortened but in isometric the length does not change what changes is the tension so you can plot the tension against time Factors affecting skeletal muscle contractions are six. Number one, the type of muscles. You got the slow twitch red or type one muscle fibers, remember the ox. And type two or pale or fast twitch fibers, remember the chicken. Each one of you listening has both types of muscle fibers. Even one of your muscles, the gastrocnemius for example, can have both fibers simultaneously. If you wanna train your fast twitch fibers, you can run on a treadmill. If you wanna increase the proportion of your slow twitch fibers, you can do plank exercises. As you get older, your muscles will switch from type two to type one. Why? Because type one will give you more stability, more posture to account for and to counteract the weakness and the deterioration that happens with aging. When Medicosis tried lifting three weights, one was light, one was heavy, one intermediate, this was the graph. Number two, stimulus factor. When you increase the strength of the stimulus, you'll increase the number of activated muscle fibers. We call this recruitment of motor units. When you increase the frequency, you'll also increase the force. Who's the hero of contraction? Calcium, the ionized calcium that is. The staircase phenomenon. Okay, let's go. Stimulus, response. Stimulus, response. These are called twitches. But what if it's stimulus, stimulus, stimulus? Oh, twitch, twitch, twitch. This is called what? Clonus, 
or unfused tetanus or incomplete and that's because you go down a little but what if you go up and never go down you just can continue upwards like that this is called fused tetanus or complete tetanus. Let's say you are a surgeon and you're just standing for three hours straight. You have tetanus in your back muscles to support your body weight. Three, the length tension relationship. Which one is the best? The best is to have an optimal amount of stretch. Not too little, not too much. When you increase the preload, oh, that's a good thing for the heart. More stretch, boom, more contraction. But if you take it too far, the heart is gonna fail. And that's your Frank Starling law. It is good within limits. When you increase the stretch, you increase contraction within limits. Why is this? Because it depends on the degree of actin and myosin. Cross bridging. The optimal amount of stretch coincides with the maximum number of cross bridges. The greatest muscle tension will happen when the load is the greatest and when you stimulate actin and myosin fibers because this is called active tension how about this one this is passive there's just a load but there is no actin myosin active tension is better than passive tension if you want to add a third graph to represent the total tension is going to be higher than both of them like that number four load velocity relationship the lesser the weight of the load the greater the shortening of the muscle fiber so it's an inverse relationship when the load is greater, the velocity decreases and the distance decreases. How about when the load is low, velocity increases and distance increases. And that's why hypotension causes tachycardia. The other cause is the baroreceptor reflex. Why do muscles get tired? Because lactic acid accumulation, muscle ATP depletion, blood flow interruption, decrease NMG transmission. Pause and review. Let's talk about muscle metabolism. Your muscle needs energy during rest, during contraction, and even after exercise, during recovery. During rest, why do you need ATP? Uh, you need some muscle tone even during rest. So even during rest, your muscle is not completely resting. I need ATP for the sodium potassium pump, which is needed for the resting membrane potential. So even during rest, I need ATP. I also need to make my glycogen and my creatine phosphate, etc. ATP, as you know, is adenosine triphosphate, which is made of adenine plus ribose. Together, they make adenosine and three phosphate groups. You have three bonds, only two of them are high energy. Who breaks the ATP into ADP? ATPase. When this happens, energy is released, phosphate is released. Who has the ATPase? The myosin heads. If you contract your muscles too hard, you will squeeze the blood vessels, and that's why it's anaerobic. During strenuous exercise, in the first five seconds, use the ATP that's already stored. But the next 15 seconds, you will need to make some new ATP. Where do I make it from? From ADP. Okay, so from ADP to ATP, I need one phosphate. Sure, here's your phosphate. Where did you get it from? From creatinine phosphate, which is in the muscle. These two together are known as the phosphagen system. After the first 15 seconds, you will turn to glycolysis, which is anaerobic, and it will give you net of two ATPs. After the first minute, you will need the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain, giving you net gain of 38 ATP molecules. During exercise, the muscle needs, let's say, 500 mL of oxygen. But during exercise, the lung can only give 400 mL. So the muscles say, okay, hey lungs, all right, I will have mercy upon you. You will owe me 100 ml and I will wait for you to give it to me after exercise. And the lungs said, bet. And that's the story of the oxygen debt. Oxygen debt is the post-exercise extra oxygen consumption. Why does your muscle need oxygen even after you have finished exercising? To reform its ATP and creatinine phosphate to remove the lactic acid, to refill the myoglobin with oxygen. And that's why even after you finish exercising, you will find that you are <laughs> hyperventilating. This is the lung paying off her debt. Your lungs listen to Dave Ramsey. <laughs> what is the motor unit? It's the nerve fiber and the muscle fiber supplied by that nerve fiber. Not all motor units are created equal. We have talked about the EMG before, remember, EMG is not just for muscles, it's for muscles and the nerve fibers supplying those muscles. This is the difference among normal neurogenic disease and myogenic diseases according to EMG. Pause and review. 
Joe Rogan is more muscular than me. That's right. Does that mean that he has more muscles? No. Does that mean that he has more muscle fibers? Also no. He has thicker fibers, more fibrils, more ATP, more creatine phosphate, more glycogen. What happens if you cut the nerve supplying that muscle? We assume that this is a lower motor neural lesion. We'll talk about muscle weakness, paralysis, flaccidity, hypotonia, hyperreflexia, atrophy, fasciculations, and fibrillations. Rigor mortis happens after you die. Why is this? Because you need ATP to detach the myosin from the actin. After death, there is no ATP. You cannot detach. So you become rigid. So this rigidity is not muscle contraction. Instead, it is failure of muscle relaxation. We're done with skeletal muscles. Some quick notes about smooth muscles. They come in two shapes, visceral or single unit and multi-unit. Gap junction, no gap junction. They obey the Ollernon law, they do not obey the Ollernon law. Smooth muscles have no sarcomere, no striation, no branches, not voluntary, no troponin, instead you have calmogen. No T-tubules, no sarcoplasm reticulum, more accurately, they are just not well developed. Calcium, calmodulin, boom, contraction. Calcium, calmodulin, boom, contraction. How did you contract? I activated a kinase. What kind of kinase? Myosin light chain kinase, that is. And this kinase added a phosphate to the myosin light chain so that the myosin light chain becomes myosin light chain phosphate. And this is active, which means contraction. The opposite effect is known as dephosphorylation by a phosphatase. And this is the story of the nitric oxide, guanylate cyclase, GTP, cyclic GMP, protein kinase G, all of these medications. Hydralazine, nitroprusside, nitrates, sildenafil, tadenafil, vordenafil. All of these cause smooth muscle relaxation and therefore vasodilation. Do not combine them together. Minoxidil diazoxide also cause smooth muscle relaxation by opening potassium channels. The beautiful thing about your heart and your gut is that even if you cut the nerve supplying your heart and the vagus supplying your stomach, they will still be able to pump and move because they have their own automaticity. In the heart, it's called the cardiac conduction system. In the gut, it's called the enteric nervous system. Calcium channels have many varieties, such as L-type, T-type, N-type, PQ-type, R-type. This is just the alpha subunit. The L-type are more sensitive to the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, such as nifidipine, amlodipine, nimodipine, etc. The T-type is not that sensitive to dihydropyridine. That's why verapamil works here, but nifidipine does not work on your heart, relatively speaking. Lambert Eaton versus Myasthenia gravis. Pause and review. Remember that Lambert Eaton has autonomic symptoms, Myasthenia does not. Lambert Eaton has diminished reflexes, Myasthenia does not. What the flip is dantrolene? It's a ryanodine receptor blocker. You can use it to manage neuroleptic malignant syndrome as well as malignant hyperthermia. Pause and review. If you like this video, you will adore my antibiotics course on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. You'll also love my endocrine pharmacology course and my autonomic pharmacology course and all kinds of courses on my website. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website for courses. Go to Picmonic for mnemonics. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.